So I would now like to welcome Professor Sankat, the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Belize and formerly of the University of the West Indies, to introduce our next keynote speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. My dear colleagues, after a good Sri Lankan lunch, you look forward to uh, dessert and coffee. Uh, I don't know where the coffee is, but we have dessert here <laughs> in that we have Mr. Mark uh, Prinsky, who will be treating us to his own special thoughts on, on, on education. He is a renowned uh, American writer and speaker on education. Mark is the one who coined the terms most of us are familiar with, digital native and digital immigrant. He did that in 2001. And he is an award-winning, internationally acclaimed speaker, author, and practical visionary in the field of education. Today, he champions an emerging, new, empowered to better the world education paradigm that more directly benefits all students and the world in which they live. Mark has spoken in over 40 countries. He has authored seven books and has published more than 100 essays. His work has been translated into a dozen different languages. Mark is the founder of the Global Future Education Foundation and the Arisenet.world, that is Real World Impact Education Network, which unites all groups in the world, offering and empowered to, to accomplish education for kids. Previously in his career, Mark headed an early prototype charter school. He spent six years at the Boston Consulting Group and founded and ran a learning games company for over a decade. Mark holds an MBA degree from Harvard with distinction and a Master of Arts in Teaching degree from Yale. He has taught at all levels from elementary to college. Mark's latest book, Education to Better the World, Unleashing the Power of 21st Century Kids, uh, and published by uh, Teachers College Press 2016, that book won the 2016 Forward Indies Book of the Year Awards in Education. And I was pleased to get a copy of it, and I just uh, give you a few of the little uh, quotes on this book. Prensky offers perhaps the most compelling case and model yet articulated by anyone for today's globally empowered children. A must read book for all educators and anyone who cares about education. And this came, came from uh, Rocky Hill School in Rhode Island and from Arizona State University. Mark Prensky offers a lucid, inspiring, optimistic, doable, and crucial blueprint for how we can build a future with the schools that children desperately need. Another one says, Mark Prensky was always ahead of his time. This book is a gold mine and a powerful wake up call. And finally, we need the better world Prensky envisions, and we need it now. So it is really a distinct pleasure and honor for me to welcome on behalf of Call and the Open University, Mr. Mark Prinsky, to address this conference. Mark? Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. I am so happy to be here. Thank you, Asha, and everybody at uh, Commonwealth of Learning and, and the uh, 
um, Open University for inviting me. I want to give a special shout out. Where are my bus friends? Hey, yes, people that I met coming in. Uh, and I've made a lot of friends, and I love this conference more than any that I've been to in a long time because it's so diverse, because there are so many people here from so many different places. I grew up in New York City. I'm used to diversity. I miss it in California, so I'm thrilled to be with you. And I'm going to talk to you about what I think the world needs from education, because it may be a little bit different uh, than what you uh, have thought about before. You already heard, if you're saying Mark who, you already heard I'm known for the digital immigrants and digital natives terms, which I was very proud to learn this year are now in the Oxford English Dictionary. I have contributed to the English language mother tongue. Uh, I apologize for speaking in American. If any of you need simultaneous translation, I'm sure it can be provided. And if you want to get the slides or you want to contact me later, I give my presentation in a very specific way where the logic of what I'm saying is all in my slides. So that en enables you, if you wanted to give this same presentation to somebody else, you could do that. And all you have to do is send me an email at markprensky at gmail.com. And my request to you, I have a request, because you represent diversity in people and places. I represent diversity of ideas. And so I'm going to ask that as you listen, there may be things that you agree with. There may be things that you disagree with. Please keep your mind open. And we can talk about this. We'll have time at the end for conversation. And we can dialogue about this all the time. And I'm, I'm thrilled to do that with everybody. So let me start with something that I think we all agree on. We all want our kids to be educated. And I think we all want all our kids to be educated. Is there anyone who disagrees with that? That's good. But here's what's a little more controversial. I think what's changing, and what's going to be changing very quickly, is what a good education is, and what being educated actually means in the world. Now, here's another question for you. Raise your hand if you're optimistic about the future. I'm glad to hear that. Raise your hand if you're pessimistic about the future. I'm less glad to hear that, but I have a piece of advice to you. Please don't share that with the kids. <laughs> because a lot of, I go into classrooms and I ask the kids, how many of you are pessimistic or scared about the future? And I get a lot of hands raised. And I fear that some of that comes from their teachers. So this is an optimistic talk. I'm going to be very optimistic with you. I'm a huge optimist about the future and the future of education. And the reason I'm an optimist is because I'm optimistic about our kids. And one of those is my kid, but I mean all kids everywhere. I think those kids represent, and I loved, I absolutely loved the term that we heard from the Seychelles, our common wealth. But I'm also a realist. And so while we want all our kids to be educated, and we more or less think of being educated in the terms that we grew up with. We all know what education is because we all went through it. What does the world want and need from education, especially going forward? And more specifically, what do our kids want and need from education going forward? And so this is really a talk where I'm going to focus on the kids and the world they'll live in. And as Asha remarked last night, one of the things that I notice when I go to conferences like this is there are very few young people. In fact, is anybody here under the age of 30? OK, welcome. <laughs> you represent half the world. <laughs> Congratulations. And I think that's something that we ought to really bear in mind, because a lot is changing. And particularly in the past, we used to know, we the adults, knew what was good for kids. We did because we were the adults and things didn't change and whatever was good for us was probably good for our kids. But now we don't. 
We don't know what's best for our kids because they don't live in our world. That's Elon Musk's car revolving around the Earth. But they're going to live in a very different world. They're living through huge changes in civilization. And this is happening everywhere. And we're largely unprepared for this. And so I'm going to show you now the image that I want you to remember and take home with you if you remember nothing else from this conference. Oh, crap, was that today? What's going on is that we, in this room collectively, except you, are the last pre-internet generation the world will ever see. It'll never happen again, because from now on, we have the first internet generation and all the generations that come after that. And that is a big, big, big difference. And what it means is things are speeding up. The pace of change, and we heard this from other speakers, is changing dramatically. In the past, in the distant past, things changed, but not very fast. So it was easy for us to give our kids the same education that we got. Then in the last few generations, things started speeding up. And we went from the Wright brothers to the supersonic jet and to the moon in less than 100 years. But things were not equal. It was unevenly spread. There were places that didn't move as fast. What's going to happen going forward is it's going to move much more quickly, and it's going to spread much more evenly. So that's what we need to be prepared for. I think human society will change more in our kids' lifetimes than it has ever changed in the history of the world. And I'm not alone in thinking that. And the reason is because we have this different pace of change. It's not easy to understand, because we didn't grow up with exponential change. We grew up with linear change. It went up slowly. And then sometimes it went up a little faster. But now we have something called exponential change. It's going up really, really fast. And it's happening everywhere. And that's what we have to learn to wrap our minds around in the future. And just to give you some examples, computing power in our kids' lifetimes is going to be up a billion times. It's already up hundreds of thousands of times from when we went to the moon. But now we're going to get another billion times. We're going to have 100 billion, 100 trillion sensors and devices around in the world. We're going to have everybody connected at high speeds. And we should do that as quickly as we can. Energy prices will get close to free. We'll see our intelligence augmented. And we'll probably send our kids out into space, either as tourists or workers or miners or whatever. And it's going to happen everywhere. And I'm not even going to read you this list. You can find it when you on your own when you get the slides. But every piece of human endeavor is going to be changed. And how fast? Well, you heard about the 100 years. You all know about Dubai that rose from the desert in 50 years, and look what it is today. Mobile phones got to most people on the planet in 40 years. Facebook went to a billion people in 10 years, and then to a second billion people in five years. We got to the cloud in less than four years, and CRISPR, which is gene editing, went from the laboratory to babies in less than four years. We have electronic cars. We have flying taxis in Dubai. We have bioprinting of organs. This is already with us. We're going to have 5G, really, really fast internet, to everybody in the world, almost certainly within five or so years. And if you believe Ray Kurzweil, who is a very forward thinker, we will connect our brains to the cloud within 15 years. Which means that we don't need to be preparing our kids for the where the world is today, or even for the where the world is tomorrow. 
We need to be thinking 15, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. What do those kids need? What kind of world are they going to be living in? Because already today in many places, any 10-year-old walking down the street can access all of human knowledge. That's a really different place to be. And what it means is that the things that we have counted on for so long, tradition and incremental improvements, that's no longer enough. We have to prepare not for the past or the today or the future or tomorrow, but for what Peter Hinson calls the day after tomorrow. And that's where your focus should be, ladies and gentlemen, on that day after tomorrow. And that's a good thing, because it means that we can leapfrog, just like the mobile phones came into places that had never had fixed phones, and they managed to leap that whole technology. We need to leapfrog in education and in what we do. It's time to put on new lenses. It's time to see our kids and education. When I say kids, I'm talking from five years old to 25 years old. I just use that term as a catch-all. It's time to see them in a very, very new way. It's time to focus on those kids. And the interesting thing that I've observed is that learning, although we talk about learning till the sun goes down and beyond, it's not the goal of education. It's a means to the goal of education, which is to accomplish useful things in the world. And I think that's a really important shift that educators need to make. Another big thing that's happening is that our kids are becoming human-machine hybrids. Does this look familiar? I blocked out the faces because it could be anywhere. The kids are on their phones. We heard about it from our friend from Nigeria. They're already integrating themselves with the devices so that it's hard to pull them away. They're already broadcasting their thoughts. And we're starting to see through these things we can look at kids and know what they're paying attention to and what they're thinking. And they're embedding technology into their bodies. So this is already starting. Now project out 5, 10, 15 years. And some people are afraid of this, but we are really doing what humans have always done. We are amplifying who we are. At one point it was we did it with the wheel, at another point we did it with electricity. Now we're doing it with this digital technology. And we need to be helping our kids do this. Because interestingly enough, machines are already better at a lot of the things that we used to do, even as we grew up. Machines are better at reading. Google has something now called Talk to Books. And it can read 150,000 books in half a second for meaning. Writing, a lot of nonfiction writing is already done by machines, accessing information, researching, translating. Our kids are not going to need to learn languages because the machines are going to do it for them. Some of those things are already here. But there's more that's coming that machines do well. Machines are actually good at many aspects of critical thinking. They're good at debating. How many of you have seen the YouTube of I? B.M. Debater. I highly recommend. Go look it up when you can. IBM Debater. Watson, their artificial intelligence machine, debates Oxford style, a, one of the best debaters in the world, and it comes to a very, very close decision. So there's all these things, project management, systems thinking, that machines are doing better, even art and music. Machines are starting to make the stuff that we listen to and that we like to look at. So what's left for us? And the answer is plenty. The answer is humans are good at dreaming. We're good at imagining and feeling and respecting. 
We're good at feeling empathetic with each other and speaking and persuading and at being compassionate and ethical. We're good at creativity. We're good at uniqueness. And we're especially good at accomplishing things. We're much better than machines at accomplishing things, particularly if we don't know in advance what we need to accomplish. Yet we still spend a lot of our time thinking that kids and humans in general need maths and English and science and social studies. That's our normal curriculum, which I abbreviate as the mess. <laughs> That's what we give in the entire world to our kids. We give them the mess. But of course, we've realized that we need a little more. We need some additions like critical thinking and problem solving, all these things that we've called 21st century skills, empathy, agility. You've heard about all these things. I call that the mess plus plus. But Passi Salberg from Finland has another name for this. He calls that the global education reform movement. And the acronym for that, ladies and gentlemen, is CHERM. <laughs> CHERM, that's all the competition and the standardized testing and the test-based accountability stuff. So let's put those two together. And what do we get? Big drum roll. We have a germy mess. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is unfortunately what a lot of our education is. The textbooks, the curricula, everything that's overstuffed, the testing, it's a germy mess. And if you want to see a picture of it, it looks like this. We just pile one more module on top of another module. And it looks, each module looks neat and clean, but it's just a big pile, and it's too much for everybody. Would, at this point, I've got to have a big caveat. Because the other side of that germy mess is that it's all of human knowledge. It's all the things that we've ever come to know as people and understand and do. So I don't want anybody to go out of here and say, Prensky says all of human knowledge is unnecessary and useless. That's not true. It's useless. It's useful. It is very useful. The problem is the germy mess is not useless. It becomes the germy mess when we get lost in the details, when we feed all of it to everybody, whether they need it or not, and especially when we don't apply it to making the world a better place. When we do that, it ceases to be the germy mess. The kids don't want it all in advance. They don't want that germy mess in advance. My kid certainly doesn't. He's 14. He goes to a great high school in Palo Alto, California, and he has one word for it, prison. <laughs> because they only need parts of it. They need the parts that are useful for getting done the things that they want to get done. The same kid comes home, and on his simulator, he flies big jet planes, seven 777s and 787s and A380s around the world. Uh, but they need relatively little in advance. Very little. They need reading probably for a little while longer. They need arithmetic. They need to know some things about government. But very, very little compared to what we try to stuff into our kids' heads in advance. And the reason they need so little is because their world is a different world. They don't need all the things that we had because they have access to all those things every day, all the time. And the bulk of what they will need, and we heard this yesterday, that the jobs haven't been invented, most of what they need hasn't been invented. So we're going to have to do this on the fly. And what that means, ladies and gentlemen, to me, is that we don't need to focus as much as we did on content. Content is all I've heard about this whole time. What content do we do? How do we deliver it in more ways to more people through electronics, all this? And that's almost all the content from the past, which is, as we've heard, the germy mess. But the other way to do it that we couldn't do before 
is we can focus on the people. We can go say to each student, what are your dreams? What are your problems that you care about? What are your strengths? And we can craft an education that works for each individual. And that's really what technology is now giving us the power to do, individualize. So what do the kids really want and need? What they really want and need is, from everything that I observe, and I go talk to kids all over the world, they want the power to affect their world. That's what they want. Kids didn't have that in the past, but they do today, and that's what we should be focusing on giving them. And I don't mean kids, just the young ones, even the adults. Because if you look at what employers say, and this is from Google, it used to be on their website, I don't know if it still is, we need people who can get things done. And ladies and gentlemen, you can go through 21 years of our education and still, and have learned a lot, and still not be able to get things done. And almost all of us, when we join whatever profession it is or company that we join, we have to start at the bottom because we don't know how to get things done. That has not been part of our education. So when we look at this cartoon, you know, we can contrast the people from our pre-internet generation who say, well, we've got to feed people all this germy mess, all this content, with the young people who say, no, 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 no. We just have to get things done, and we'll learn whatever content we need along the way individually. Because we live in a time where individuals, particularly in small teams, anywhere, in any of your countries, at any age, can attack real, real world problems. And they can do it on the family scale, on the team scale, on the community scale, cultural, national, world, and cosmic scales. But that's what the kids really want. Real world accomplishment. Accomplishment is different, in my mind, from achievement. Achievement is great, you become valedictorian, you climb the mountain, that's for you. Accomplishment is for others, it's for the world. And that's what the kids want to do. And since we're in Scotland, I can quote a Scot, Thomas Carlyle, from the 18th century, who said, nothing builds self-confidence and self-esteem like accomplishment. So we've known this for a while. And yet, and yet, too often, we treat our kids as if they can't do anything without us, without the educators. And we treat them as if they were pets. We say, sit here, go here, do this, roll over, perform the tricks that I taught you. That's testing. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, our kids are not pets. I don't know if we were when we grew up, but today I can assure you that they're not pets and they don't want to be treated as pets. They know they're becoming empowered and they're going to do it with us or without us. They want to increase their power to affect the world now. And our job should be and is really to empower kids further. And that's why this is a, such a huge opportunity because I've been listening to all these statistics that say, you know, 19% uh, or the age of the median age of, of Africa people is 19 or 27 in, in other places. That means there's a lot of kids in the world, a lot of kids. And by empowering those kids, we unleash their power to make a better world. And they are waiting on us to do that. And that's what's really missing. If you want my opinion, Prensky's opinion, what's missing from our education is accomplishment, is getting things done. And that's what we should be focused on. I'm not a huge fan of this term lifelong learning. It's important, but what we really want to do, I wrote a, an article called Why Those Promoting Lifelong Learning Get Only Partial Credit. You get some. 
but only partial credit because we don't want lifelong learning. We want lifelong accomplishment. That's why we're doing the lifelong learning. But if it doesn't lead to the accomplishment, it's not worth anything. It's not worth paying for. And how different a world would it be if kids left school not with a diploma, not with credentials, not with a transcript, but with a resume of accomplishments, a list of personal and team accomplishments that they could point to and by which we could judge their capabilities and merits. I want every kid to be able to say, see that? Last year, that was terrible. It was bad. It was smelly. It was ugly. It was dirty. This year, it's great. And I and my team did that. And I think you could take a whole country and do that. And one, in my book, I have a whole chapter of how you could spend a whole year with every kid in the country doing projects that improve your country. And boy, would you have a better country after that one year, in my view. So we all know that this is not a Pollyanna world. Our kids are going to live in a world of good and bad, and there are going to be tons of problems. We all know what they are, a lot of them. Climate change, political change is happening now, technology change is happening. All of these kids see these problems. They blame us a lot of the time for having created them. Sometimes they're right. But the difference from the past, and this is so important, is that it's a world in which they can do something about. A world which they can do something about, they can make these positive changes because they're entering a world where they have agency. We didn't grow up with agency as kids, but today's kids have agency. They have extended minds that are all networked together. And just give it a few years and everybody will have that. And they can all, therefore, be explorers and accomplishers from the very earliest ages of even kindergarten. And that is what's caught us all by surprise. That's what that cartoon is, except for the kids. They know it. They're fighting climate change. Is there anyone in the room who has not heard of Greta Thunberg, the woman who's been fighting climate change, the young woman who just took the boat across the ocean so she didn't have to fly? Kids are collaborating online. Kids are doing real-world projects. I recently heard of some students in Bangladesh. They got so fed up with the traffic and how people drove, they went out into the streets and started directing traffic themselves and giving out tickets. <laughs> yeah, the kids. They already see that we live in a time where they, in small teams, anywhere at any age, can attack the problems that they see. And this is our huge, huge opportunity. This is a time when our kids can be, and this is my favorite word from my friend, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Zowile. Right when I come to my favorite word, I lose my voice. <laughs> the word is solutionaries. If you have some water, that would be great. Ray, can I raise my hand? Will you call on me? <coughs> okay, maybe that that'll a little water will be good. Okay, I've raised my hands, I've had a drink of water, I'm back. So our kids know that they're solutionaries. They see this. They are starting to understand this, and we need to see it too. That's really what has to happen. We need to change our perspective on who kids are. So how do we do that? How do we help them get ready? We focus on them not as learners, I don't like that term at all. We focus on them as people, people with their own dreams and ideas and, and things that they want to accomplish. We don't just feed them content. They're not pets. We don't have to give them pet food. We support their dreams. This is a teacher whose students said about her, she showed me I could take my dreams as seriously as I wanted, and he became a famous actor. 
we help them understand individually what they care about, what they're good at, what they love to do, so they don't wind up doing something they don't love to do. We're very bad at helping kids understand this. We are particularly poor at that because we've never focused on it. But that's what the kids want from us. Look at me as a person. See education as empowerment, which leads to accomplishment, which leads to impact, positive impact on the world, which leads to a better world, which is what we all want. And by seeing the skills as not just thinking, which is the academic way to look at skills, but action and relationships and especially real world accomplishment. We have to think, change our thinking to seeing education as being about accomplishing and bettering your world and being empowered to take positive action and applying your passions, not just having them, getting things done, doing in the real world and not just in the ivory tower or the classroom, and being prepared for anything. So here's what we do. What we do today is the old form of education. Because somebody said to me, we were having a conversation, he said, yeah, we've always thought that the world, that education was about making the world better. And it is. I think that that's true. But we've been very indirect about how we did it. We put kids together with content. Content, content, content hoping that they would get some learning of that content, hoping that they would become better people intellectually. And then the big bet came. The big bet was, would they go out and improve the world? And some did, some didn't, most didn't. So that's not the best way. The much better way is to put kids together with real world problems. It's much more direct. We focus them from the beginning on the problems they come out with solutions, often they're better solutions than we had. The world improves just because they're going into school. But even better, even better, we get empowered, world-improving people in all of our countries, in all of our communities for the rest of our lives. So the answer to what the world needs from education, my answer, is world-improving people. That's what we want. Or you could say 8 billion unique symbiotic hybrids constantly adding value to the world. Or you could say just more simply, people who can get things done. So now let me give you a few examples. And we'll go through these quickly. But these are things that kids have already done at all levels. These are projects that have been completed, and there are thousands of them. I've collected a bunch in a, in a database, which you can get at btwdatabase.org, or you can get it on your phone. Primary school kids are mapping the brain. Now, how could primary school kids map the brain? Because there's a game called iWire, and iWire requires you to figure out the connectome of the brain. And guess what? Young kids can do that. They're creating and sharing and preserving culture. In Iceland, they're making audiobooks in order to preserve the Icelandic language. Maybe you could do that in some of your countries. They're designing things for their community. A group of fourth graders found out that their community wanted a water park. And they put out an RFP for a water park. The kids said, we can design that. They did. They lobbied the city council. They got approved. And when the architects built the water park, they built the kids' designs. So talk about the kids being able to point to something and say, you know, that didn't exist. And now, because of our team, it does. They can barter the tech skills they already have for skills they don't, like for reading skills with old people. This is a project in France. By the time they get to middle school, they can operate drones. In South America, they're using drones for reseeding places that need reseeding because of mining. They're printing, 3D printing prosthetic hands for people who don't have them and all kinds of body parts. But not just printing, which is easy because you just download the plans. 
they can go out using their social media skills and find the kids who need the hands and the prostheses. And so now the world is holding handathons where they make hands for kids. We had a big problem in Flint, Michigan in the US with lead in the drinking water, and it was hard to measure. Well, guess who solved that problem? An 11-year-old. She came up with a way with her phone and a sensor to measure the lead in drinking water. Or we have a problem, some of you may have this, with parents, this is hard to understand, leaving kids in their hot cars while they go shopping. And kids actually die from that. And so this kid said, no, you don't have to do this. This 11-year-old said, I'll invent a seed. If a kid gets too hot, it sprays water on the kid. It calls the cops, and it calls the parents. An 11-year-old. 13-year-old's grandmother had Alzheimer's disease, didn't recognize people. 13-year-old, smart girl, she said, we have facial recognition in the world. She designed an app that her grandmother can point to anybody who comes into the room, and it will tell the grandmother who it is. So this is what our middle school kids are doing. They're turning waste into useful products, like styrofoam into water filters, and old tires into furniture, and scrap into science projects, and even cloth into sanitary pads in rural India. Which means by the time they get to high school, they can be doing much more sophisticated projects, robots and controllers, and creating news and writing news and art and cleaning some of these big things in the world that really nobody's figured out how to clean before, and mini supercomputers and 3D printing. They can do apps that reduce police abuse by having a Yelp for police encounters and being able to compare the different cities. They can reduce bullying by letting kids reserve seats at non-bullying lunch tables. They can maintain things all over the country in remote places through sensors. And kids have already, high school kids in the world, have created new ways to diagnose Ebola, breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, plant diseases, and more. And they're monitoring earthquakes around the globe and forests and marine debris. These are what our kids are capable of doing. By the time they get to university, well, it would really be useful if they'd had 12 years of doing this, but even if they just get there now, at MIT they invented a football that collects the energy from being kicked, and you can take it home at night and use it to power your house, your lights, your devices. They can capture CO2 in paint so that houses can be like trees and take CO2 out of the air. They can edit genes. And one of the things, and especially seeing this wonderful pitch here, reminded me that you can take big spaces, football fields, and turn them into organic gardens. And at one university, they did that. And so suddenly, all their university students learn not only to be organic gardeners, but to feed the entire poor community around them. And ladies and gentlemen, that is just the beginning. People are doing this all over the world. The kids want to. You can go to the database, btwdatabase.org. And that's what people are going to have to do in the future. They're going to have to use these extended minds and networked minds well and wisely to get useful things done. It's not about content. And as educators, we need to be helping them. So we have two options, as I see it. Option one is we, continue, we can continue refining the germy mess. We can spread it to more people in more ways, and we can do lots of MOOCs. There's a gentleman here who did 300 MOOCs, <laughs> and he still doesn't have a job. But here's what I told him. You know what? In, a, in your generation, you can do things because now you have that expertise. You can start webinars. You can start a YouTube channel, and you can distribute that to people all over the world who want some of your expertise and earn a living in an entirely new way. So we can do that. We can join the germ. 
we can improve how we teach the mess. And that will give us a pet food curriculum, which is what we have. Or, and this is the huge opportunity in the world, we can create the real world impact empowerment education for kids and all people, where you're empowered to better your world, and that's what we help you be able to do. It's an alternative. It's not the academic education. It's not the vocational education. It's the accomplishment education based on accomplishment and real world impact and student empowerment. And it's structured around the dreams and interests and strengths of concerns of each kid. And to me, that is our challenge for the future. How do we do it? Well, it doesn't exist today except in a few places here and there. So we have to invent it. Isn't that great? We can actually do something. We can create a better kind of education for our kids. And that's already happening. There's a group called Design for Change that if it doesn't exist in your country, it already exists in 60 countries, you should look it up. They're doing a lot of this with kids. It's being invented around the globe, and it's being invented in a great many ways. So each of you can do it locally. You can fit this kind of education to where you're from and what you do and what your needs are. And it can be permanent, it can be side by side, it can be every other month. There are so many ways it can be done, but you've got to start thinking along these lines. So really what I'm here to do today is plant a seed. I'm planting a seed, I hope it'll grow in your mind and flourish, and that it'll flourish in each of your countries and around the world. And you're right at the beginning of this because it's just starting, but our kids truly need it, and we all truly need it. So let me give you quick concluding thoughts. Imagine if your country were known, whatever country you're from, not from your ranking on the PISA tables, which is what everybody talks about, but your country were known for being the place that produces people who can get things done. If you want people to get things done, hire kids from that country. And if we make the purpose of education to better the world, for youth to better their world, it would unleash the energy, creativity, and compassion of students and teachers in ways that we never imagined. So we're today on the ground floor of a very new world to come. It's a world full of imagination. It's a world full of creativity. It's a world full of innovation. And it's a world full of entrepreneurial spirit. And that's all over the place. And our kids are already people with extended minds all networked together. Not all of them, but they're moving really fast. And they're on their way to becoming super powerful symbiotic human hybrids. And just wait, if you don't see it today, it will be true in 10 years when these kids go out into the workplace. They live in a world where accomplishment is more important than credentials, any credentials, badges, whatever you want to offer them. So everything we do for our kids and for our adults should empower them further to accomplish and better their world. So don't get caught by surprise. Start now. And how can you start? You can go to arisenet.world, and you can start to see the coalition that's being put together of places around the world. And that's where I recommend you go. And I wish you good luck. Thank you.